Good afternoon. We're going to get started. Today we're going to um, continue working on proofs and we'll start on logic circuits. Uh, first I wanted to um, answer a few questions that were asked on Piazza in case you haven't taken a look at it lately. Um, the lab number three is um, on some software called Novanet. And it is uh, a client server software that was built specifically for education. And on it, we have an intelligent tutor for proofs. And it was made by computer science master students. And um, I modified it for my PhD. It is not, um, you know, hasn't been updated in a long time, but it, it works well. And we've been using it for this class since 2002, um, possibly before. It looks like. Can you guys hear me okay? The system thinks that the audio is not being recorded. Let me. Okay, so here's problem 10 from the Novanet proofs tutorial. And um, we are given A implies the quantity B or C, and B implies D are two givens. And then we're trying to prove A implies the quantity C or D. So the first step when we're trying a direct proof is to look for a pattern in the proof statement and see if we can match that pattern somewhere in the givens. So I want you to look for a pattern and write down what it is that you found on your paper briefly. And, and figure out which line it's on. So circle the number of the line that it's on. Then check with your neighbor and see if they found the same thing. OK, so when we were looking at this, we wanted to get rid of the B or C and somehow get C or D. But I'm not focused on that right now. What I'm focused on is getting rid of B or C in this implication because it doesn't match what's on the right-hand side of my proof statement. So I'm looking at line 2, and I have B implies D. And so I have two applications here. I'm going to have to combine them. The only rule that lets me combine two applications and gets rid of stuff is hypothetical syllogism. So what I have to have, though, for hypothetical syllogism is I have to have the right-hand side of one implication matches the left-hand side of another one. So I need to get B or C implies something else, and I don't care what it is. So I look at line two, and I say, well, I could or C on the left, and if I do that, I have to or C on the right, correct? So I can do that, and that's one of the application rules, and it came from line two. And then I could do hypothetical syllogism with lines one and three. And am I done yet? Not quite. So it doesn't look exactly what, like what I'm trying to prove. So in order to get it to look exactly right, I have to do commutative. So from line four, I did commutative. So in case uh, you didn't notice, when I'm, what I'm writing here is reference numbers to the lines that I'm using. So that's the source for something new that I'm deriving. And that's what I'm writing over here. So don't substitute stuff just because they have implications. You're not allowed to do it. There's not a rule called substitution. There is, but it only works if I have this. If I have a biconditional, I can do substitution. But otherwise, it's the only, the only way to do it is to use hypothetical syllogism or modus ponens. OK, so we can do this uh, by contradiction also. So I want you to try that on your paper by contradiction. So remember the cheap way of doing by contradiction, right? If I already have a direct proof, the cheap way is what? Write the negation of the conclusion. So put a not, put the parentheses, copy the proof statement, and write as the reason negation of conclusion. Then I and these two things together because they're opposites.
And that was on line five and line six. And I did conjunction because everything in a proof is technically added together, so I can add them together on a line if I want to. And that is a contradiction. Did someone say really? Um, it's a contradiction because we have a thing and we have its opposite. Both claim to be true because everything I write in a proof is a claim that is true. So since both of them are claimed to be true and they're opposites, that can't happen at the same time in logic. It might happen in the world, but it's not happening in logic. Okay, so they can't happen at the same time. So the negation of the conclusion must be false. So it's a contradiction. I can't have a contradiction in logic, so something must have been wrong, and that's the negation of the conclusion, therefore the conclusion is true. So that was the cheap way to do a proof by contradiction. Now, the standard way is to do that negation of the conclusion right away. So write not parentheses, A implies C or D. I'm not skipping any step in doing this, because if you write down the negation of the conclusion wrong, you will be messed up. So don't skip anything. Just put not parentheses and copy down what you're trying to prove. This is the only time you get to negate something in your proof, is if you're going to do a proof by contradiction. Now, I want to do De Morgan's with this, but De Morgan's doesn't work on implications. So we need to change the implication into an or, right? Okay, so try that on your paper. I want you to break it down as much as possible. That means distribute the knots from outside in. Use the implication rule, then use simplification if you can. And then we'll see what you get. Two of your solutions. And um, the first thing that everybody did, which is good, was turned this implication into an or. Uh, because we don't have De Morgan's to spread a knot across parentheses. So that was from line three and the implication rule. And then five, we're going to do De Morgan's so we get not not A or not the quantity C or D. And that was four and De Morgan's. That's right, it's an and, not an or, because De Morgan's flips my operators. And then if I do double negation, I get A and not the quantity C or D. So that's 5 and double negation. And then if I'm going to distribute the second knot, I get A and not C and not D. And that's from 6 and De Morgan's again. And then I can do simplification. So from 7, um, technically, if I was doing this in deep thought, it would probably make me keep some parentheses around this, and I'd have to simplify not C and not D, and then simplify the not C, and simplify the not D from that. But humans can look at stuff and skip steps. So I'm human. I can look at your things. I might act like a computer sometimes. But I'm not. Okay. Now, remember that when we did our proof by contradiction that we can only get our contradiction by things that were derived from the negation of the conclusion. So all of these are, but mostly I'm going to use 8, 9, and 10, right? Because I wanted to simplify all this stuff so I didn't have to look at a complex long statement. So I really don't need 3 through 7 anymore. I'm going to use 8, 9, and 10 and combine them with the givens, which are lines 1 and 2, to see what I can get. Now, um, one thing you have to look out for is you cannot combine 9 and 1 together. So at least one person, I looked at their stuff, and they had A implies B as one of the lines of their proof. That is logically true, but none of our rules actually give it to us. So we are not allowed to do that. Okay, You can't do it directly. There's two different ways to do it, but I actually recommend that all you do is combine lines 1 and 8 and if I combine 1 and 8, what can I get? B or C. And don't put parentheses around stuff. So the minimum amount of parentheses is what you want to do. So less writing is good for you. 
So that was from modus ponens. And we've, we've used this one. And we've used line one. So now let's use uh, 10 and 2. What will we get if we combine 10 and 2? We can get not B directly. Now, I saw some people who actually went through several steps to do this. So what they did is they converted B implies uh, D to not B or D, and then they did destructive syllogism. And some people actually wrote that down, and then they wrote down this with conjunction. Uh, don't do that. It's extra work, and I'm not sure what your tutor's systems will do with that. So it's legal, but it's a pain. Um, also, NovaNet only will display 19 lines, so you should try to keep your proofs that long. It'll store 22, but it will only show 19 of them. So you don't want you don't want things to disappear. Uh, so try to keep them shorter than that. So that's another reason to work them on paper. Make sure they're under 19 lines, 19 or under. You can do them all in that amount of time, guaranteed, as long as you don't do this. Okay, so when we combined not D with B implies D, that was modus tollens. That was the if if I'm not wet, it must not have rained rule. So that was 2 and 10 and modus tollens. Okay, by the way, if you're doing a proof on the test and you don't put reasons, it's going to be minus 2 for every reason that isn't there. So... So put your reasons. Okay, so we got not B, and we also have, so we've all already used 1, 2, 8, and 10. So we should use, all of these are good now, but now we can combine any of these. So not C and B or C will give me P. So that's 9 and 11 and disjunctive syllogism. And we have not B and B from 12 and 13 and conjunction. And then that is a contradiction. And some of you may have actually gotten, instead actually done 11 and 12 and gotten C and then C and not C as your contradiction. So any of those is fine. If you get anything ended with its opposite, you're done with the proof. Any questions? Yes, NovaNet is sufficiently uh, intelligent that it will accept any contradiction that you get. So anything you derive is going to be fine. It's just it doesn't store more than 19 lines. Um, and actually, I made a mistake. The rule for... Um, B implies D, we or to C on both sides. That's actually not on your printed axiom list. Um, so let me give you a workaround for that. I apologize for using a rule that doesn't exist. Uh, it existed on an old, old, old version. Is everybody ready for me to move this? It is not okay to skip 8, 9, and 10. So that was the question. Can we skip 8, 9, and 10? No, you cannot. You could, but if you did, what you'd have to do is the new things I derive, I have to put them in that and statement. And I don't think that the NovaNet tutorial will let you do it anyway. So it's technically okay, but then I would have to, when I derive B or C, I'd have to put B or C and not C and not D because I have to actually use the whole line that I'm using. So when I combine lines, I'm actually combining whole lines usually. I have to because I'm not allowed to use them any I'm not allowed to use the rules any other way. That's why I have to do simplification. That's a good question. Any other questions about this proof? Okay, so let's figure out how we can trick our system into letting us or the same thing on the both sides of an application. So we had B implies D, and we wanted B or C implies D or C. And we know it's true. Because we proved it by truth table in class. 
Also, it makes sense, right? If two things imply each other, oring the same thing with both of them makes sense. Okay, so how do we do it? The workaround is to write down something we know is true, and we find that on the rule list. Can you find that for me, Ben, on the axiom list? So, yes, find something implies itself is logically equivalent to 1. 24. Okay, so we also know that not P or P is logically equivalent to 1, right? So if we didn't have a rule that said something implies itself is always true, we actually know that if we or something with its opposite, that's always true. It's logically equivalent to 1. And this can be changed into an implication. Right? So this is the tautology rule. It's probably 25. And this is implication rule on that. Now the Movinet will let you put in anything that's true. So if something's logically equivalent to 1, you can just put it in your proof anytime you want. So I can write not P or P or not C or C or C and plus C anytime I want in a proof, and I can write the rule number for it. Okay, so I can put 24 down for C and C, and then I can do constructive dilemma with these two. So I can get B or C implies D or C with, let's say this is line 1 and this is line 2, so with 1 and 2 and constructive dilemma. So that is our workaround. If you don't have a rule, you can always figure out a way to prove it. Oh, there was one other trick I wanted to tell you with the deep thought tutorial. If you're doing a proof and you get stuck, try addition. So remember what addition was? If I know something's true, I can or anything I want with it. Okay, so deep thought has these funny things. It just ors random stuff in there sometimes, so you might need to do that. So for example, if it tells you to uh, prove B or C and you can derive B, well, you can just use addition to put or C on there. So prove what you can, and then if you have got some other or stuff you need to prove, just a word on there. Okay, so let me give you an example of when you might want to use that. Let's say I have this, and I, I don't even care what I'm proving. Let's just say I want to combine these two lines. The addition rule says, what the addition rule actually says is B logically implies B or C. I'm just substituting the letters. It says P implies P or Q. Logically implies that, right? So addition says, if I know something, I can or anything I want with it. So I can actually take this entire line and write it in my proof, but use a regular implication. Because it is true. So this statement is a tautology. That's what that double line means. Right? So if I have a double line implication, that's a logical implication, then that means the entire statement itself is true. And I can write true statements anytime I want in my proof. So that's a true statement, so I can just write the entire thing. But I don't use this operator. So I use the regular implication, and I can write the whole rule in there. Ben. The question is, does it require B to be true? So this statement says, if B is true, then D or C is true. And it says, this statement's always true. So it actually doesn't matter if B is true or not. So line three here is always true. And it's because of the addition rule. And I don't refer to any other lines. So here's the trick in Novanet. If you want to write something in there, you have to refer to its own line. Because it's going to make you put a line number in there. Put the line that you're on. And by the way, occasionally, it will let you put true things in there with absolutely ridiculous reasons. Don't do that. You are wasting your time if you try to game the Novanet system. So if you write something true in there, 
there's some random mix of stuff that you can do that will occasionally let you do like a two-line proof, which isn't possible for any of the problems. So if you did your proof in two lines, erase it and do it again. Because you're wasting your own time. So the purpose of DevNet is not to make me happy. It's for you to practice so you can do the test problems quickly. Okay. So it does not require for me to be true because this implication is always true. So I can write the entire statement. Now, if I had, if I just wanted to write B or C down, I have to have the B as true. Does everybody see that? So if I want to write down B or C, I have to know that B is true. But I can write down that B implies B or C because that's always true. That's what the rule says. The addition rule says, I've done a truth table proof that says, if you know B, then you know B or C. Okay, so now I can actually say, I can combine 1 and 3 to get A implies B or C. And that is hypothetical syllogism. And then I can combine 4 and 2 to get A implies D. So my goal was to combine 1 and 2. So if I see the right-hand side of something, and it would match the left-hand side of something if it has an OR, no problem. Just use the addition rule to get that OR in there the way you want, and then you could do a lot of hypothetical syllogisms. Okay, now, don't ever try to have three reference lines in a rule because there are no rules on Nevinet that will let you use three reference lines. So don't skip over something on here and try to go straight to this and just put another reference line. Even though it's like I'm just going to do a lot of hypothetical syllogisms and you might think that that's okay, but the system, like I said, is a dumb computer. You have to do it the way it wants. No, it doesn't matter which order you use your line numbers. Any questions on this? Okay. We're going to do an introduction to logic circuits now. So we referred to them a lot, uh, but we actually haven't drawn any, so we're going to do some. So here's what our logic gates look like. So for AND, it looks like a big D. And for OR, it looks like that same thing, only make it pointy and round on the back. And the knot is a little triangle with a circle on the front. The circle is the most important part of that. And for each of these, we assume that our voltage is coming from the left, our power source is on the left, and that on the right, all of our current is going to flow from left to right on this diagram with these gates. And the inputs are on the left and the outputs are on the right. So just like when we had our truth tables, we had our inputs on the left of the truth table. And we have our outputs on the right of the truth table. So our gates also do that. Our gates go from left to right. And these are all, uh, there's pictures of all these in your packets too. So this is from packet number two. There's only one other gate that we occasionally use, but we usually don't draw too many of them, and that is exclusive OR, which is the same as an OR, but we put an extra bar on the back. Okay, so how does this relate to our logic when we have inputs on the left, the output on the right will be P and Q if we have our AND gate. And you can also write it as P dot Q because when we start doing circuits, we use multiplication instead of AND. I don't care which one you write it as, but just know that engineers are going to use ANDs, I mean multiplies, and logic people are going to use hats. That's what you call that character, right? That's a hat. <laughs> okay. Um, so if we have P and Q here, we're going to get P plus Q as the output. And if we have P on the right here, on the left, then we get not P as the output. Um, the not is actually usually written uh, by engineers how? With a bar over the top of the variable. 
Um, one reason why we don't actually usually use that a lot is, well, there's two reasons. One is you can't type that on a computer. Another one is it often looks like a smudge on your paper. <laughs> so we often will still use a, a not in front of the variable, so you could also write just not P. Um, but be sure that you know, you know where you've put knots and where you haven't. So one thing I try to do is try to not be messy when I'm writing down my logic stuff. Okay, so that means when I put a knot, I actually put a little, even a little more space than I did right here, and I actually use the, uh, the kind of half T for the notch, just because then I make sure I know that there's a thing there and it wasn't just a mark on my paper. Okay. So just be really careful with that because knots mess everything up, right? Remember that knots turn things into lies. So if you accidentally get knots where they don't belong, then you've messed everything up. Okay? All right, so these are just very straightforward, and it's also very straightforward to draw a circuit from a logic statement. So I'm going to give you one, and then I want you to draw. Well, I'll do a couple examples, and then we'll give you some to practice. And actually, we don't really use P's and Q's in circuits. We use X's and Y's and Z's. So we'll start using those. OK, so here's a simple expression, X, Y, or Z. So this might be the result of someone telling me that I want to turn on an alarm if I have um, the door is open and the window is open, or the garage is open. I want to turn on my alarm if any of those things happen. Okay? So that's the kind of problem that we get as engineers. Say, I want this thing to happen if these other things exist. So I have to write a statement for that. So if I want to draw gates for it, this is an AND, right? So I want to do the AND first because it's inside parentheses. X and Y are the inputs. And then the output of that becomes an input to an OR. And so this, the output here is XY. That's Z going in. So this is going to be XY plus Z. Easy peasy, right? This is like the easiest thing we do in the whole class. Yay. <laughs> you guys are so not excited today. <laughs> okay, let's do a couple more. Okay, let's try x or y times the quantity not x plus not y. So how many gates do you need? Okay, some people said three. How many people said five? Okay, both of them are correct. So you can do it with three if you use just little bubbles for knots, which I didn't tell you about, but some of you already know that, right? Okay, so there's also, you are allowed to do things that are cheap in this class. So you might not be allowed in your electrical engineering classes, but I don't care if you use not X as an input. So I can do this. Okay, that's cheating, right? But you're allowed to do it. Okay, not really the best idea because those knots might be ignored and someone who gets this piece of paper from the engineer will probably build the wrong thing because they'll just ignore those knots and put X's and Y's in there. Okay, so it's a better thing to not put that and to put knots on your gates. So if you just gave, did the gates that I gave you to begin with, you would have actually had to have a knot before we go into our OR gates. 
and then and those things together. Okay, so t these two things are logically equivalent. So a little circle right before I hit a gate means negate that value before I get there. So we're going left to right. Anytime I see a little circle, it means whatever's on this wire, negate it. Okay, so do I want to see this? No, I don't. I want you to use this shorthand because it's much faster. Now, if I say, draw this circuit on the test, should you reduce it first? No. Why do extra work? You have to use your brain to reduce it. You need almost no brain to draw the circuit, right? Just draw it. The next problem will be to reduce it. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm going to separately ask you to draw circuits from reducing them, okay? Because I don't want you to suffer if you can't reduce it, but I do want you to show me that you can draw a circuit. And I had a question back there. So the question is, do I mind if you draw the X and Y inputs once? Um, and let me show you how that looks for people who haven't seen it before. I don't mind if you do that. So if you like to make your stuff on your wonderful engineering paper and draw lines and dots and all that stuff, you're allowed to do that. Okay, so here's how it looks, you guys. You are not required to do this. So I can do it nicely, and I know what it is, but you don't have to do that. So you are allowed to put your inputs on the left. Okay, you see what I just did right there? Yeah, you should write that again. <laughs> you can barely see that on there. And I know that some of you guys and girls will randomly write little things so it's not clear whether there's a knot there or not because you're not sure. It's going to be marked wrong if I can't tell which one you meant. So don't just try to squiggle things around. It's not going to work. This is fine. I don't care if you do this or not. Um, it's probably not going to be worth your time for some of the problems, but um, you're totally allowed to do that, but you're not required to. Um, just so you know, you guys, these black dots means just pull this value from this line. So this is like a solder connection. This is actually a knot. So if it's an open circle, it's a knot. And if it's a closed dot on a line, that means just pull this value from this line. Any questions on that? It is as easy as it seems. So we're going to go from left to right. We make gates from inside out. All right, so... Now I'm going to come back to why we did all that mess with the structure of normal form. So um, you are going to have a test on your um, a test problem uh, where I give you uh, a written description of a circuit I want you to make, and you have to draw the truth table and then draw the circuit and reduce it. And also make it only with OR gates, for example. So let's do an example of that. Okay, so we're going to do a multiplexer. As our example, does anybody know what a multiplexer is? Raise your hand if you know what a multiplexer is. One, two, you guys don't want to admit it, so I think it's more than that. But, okay, we got about 20 maybe. Um, so, who wants to tell me what a multiplexer is? Okay, so I have a bunch of inputs coming in to a multiplexer, and I have a control input that says which one to send out the other side. So does anybody know what we might use that for? So let me just draw a picture of a multiplexer.
Okay, so we have inputs on the left. Remember, they're always on the left. We often put control bits on the sides just because they're not exactly, we don't think of them the exact same way, but they're still inputs, and this is an output. So C is also an input. So all of these are inputs. So the truth table for this, I'm going to have to have C, X0, and X1. Now when C is 0, I want the output to be X0. And when C is 1, I want the output to be X1. So now that you see this description, can you think of anything we might use this for? A calculator? That's interesting. Um, I would have to work a while to explain how to use that for a calculator. Um, but let's use a simpler example. So I know that None of you have has ever experienced a home phone with a wire, have you? Okay, okay, so your parents have these things. Okay, I don't even have one anymore. But we have the cables coming to our house, right? For cable, for internet, for phone, used to be. Maybe you have it, maybe you don't. But those wires are going to be sending signals to everybody from from central stations, right? And I've got to decide which one to send to your house. So if, especially if it's a phone call to your house, um, and routers need to figure out where to send signals and which ones to send through. So right at that junction between the, the wires coming from the central station and your house, so the street to your house, you have to figure out which signals to send to you. So multiplexer is part of the circuit to do that. Also, anybody have a pool? Okay, so your pool has like multiple valves coming in, right? And so I have to decide what water I want to come into the pump. So I've got to switch on and off the different pipes coming in. So a multiplexer could do the same thing. Okay, so we have a truth table here. When we have three values for inputs, we have to have how many rows? Eight rows. So the first one, we're going to do four C's of zero and then four ones and then we'll do two and two for the next one and alternate for the last one. Now we have to read this statement to figure out what y is going to be. So when c is zero I want to output x zero so it's going to be zero zero one one and when c is one I want to output x one. So I just copied over the variable that I want to output. So when C is 0, I'm going to ignore what X1 is. And when C is 1, I'm going to ignore what X0 is. Now I need to build a circuit to do this. So the easiest way to do this is to write in disjunctive normal form Y. Well, that's not the easiest way, but it is the guaranteed to do it, and you're going to have to do it on the test. So I will say, write down this circuit in destructive normal form. Okay? So I want you to do that. What does that mean? That means everywhere there's a one for y, you need to write what the state of the world is. The state of the world is each of the variables, either it's not if it's a zero, and it's not if it's not. So we end those together. So on the third row, we have c is false. We have x0 is true, and we have x1 is false. And we're multiplying those. And when I start getting complex, I do put the bars on top, because then it's easier to read. All right, on the next row, we have c is false, x0 is true, and x1 is also true. The next place we have a 1 is in the sixth row, where c is true x0 is false, and x1 is true. Then the last one that we have is in the very last row where c is true, 
x0 is true and x1 is true. So each one of the ones that we have for y corresponds to one of these rows. Remember that we write down the state of the world in a row if it has a 1 in it. And then what do we do with all of those separate conjunctions? We or them together. So y is actually equal to all of this or together. Now you can draw this circuit. And that will be the next thing I ask you to do. Now, you're also allowed to do cheap stuff like use three input AND gates. Okay, so a three input AND gate, I have to have one, two, three, four of them. One, two, three, four. I need to OR them all together so I can have four input OR gates. That's a giant OR. Okay, and then I'm going to put C, X, 0, and X, 1 on all of them. So that last one is all positive, so I just send it right in there. The first one has a knot on the C and a knot on the X1. So draw your knots first so you don't have to have them um, over your lines because it gets messy and then it's not super clear what you're doing. So we're going to put knot C on the second one. And the third one we have a knot for X0. And then we're done. So that we got to do all on automatic. So I figured out the truth table. I wrote down the disjunctive normal form. I drew a circuit for it. Now the next thing you might need to do is draw it only with AND gates or only with OR gates. So De Morgan's tells us that if I want to swap a gate, I negate all the inputs and outputs. So that means every gate has a secret life inside. That was a good look. Every gate has a secret life inside. So this OR gate is secretly inside, has all negated inputs and negated outputs. So inside, so if I want to swap it, all I have to do is draw that inside and then erase the OR gate. Okay, I know you can barely see that. Let's zoom in. So how are, however many inputs I have, and I have to negate them all for De Morgan's and negate the output so I can swap an OR gate into an AND gate or vice versa. So all of these AND gates are secretly inside NOR gates. So they are ORs on the inside with knots on all of the inputs and the outputs. The last thing we're going to do is reduce this circuit. So I'm going to copy it over again. Okay, so there's our circuit. We want to reduce it. What does reducing mean? It means do it with less gates. Okay, so we're going to look for commonality to do a reduction. So in the first two terms, did I copy it down right? Yes. In the first two terms, I actually see some common stuff. So I see not C, X, 0 in the first two terms. And if I factor those out, I can do it just like I do regular multiplication. So if I see like 5 times 7 times 20 and then 5 times 7 times 35, I can put 5 times 7 out front and put 20 plus 35 in the rest. Yes. The name of the axiom is distribution. And we can do the same thing over here. Uh, 
except it's C and X1 is actually what's in common in these two terms. So we have C and X1. And then what we have on the first term is not X0 plus X0. So these two terms with distribution rule, and the same thing here, these two terms of distribution. By the way, for this, we do formal proofs. And, um, but here, I don't, I don't mind if you don't write, write the rules out as long as it's real clear. Okay, so we just factored pairs of terms. But what is not x1 plus x1? That's a 1. And not x0 plus x0 is a 1. Anything times a 1 is that thing back. So we get not c x0 plus c x1. So when you're doing a reduction, look for patterns and try to pull them out. The other thing you need to do is do De Morgan's from the outside in. De Morgan's from the outside in. What does that mean? If I have a knot on the outside of parentheses, do that first before you do anything inside. Okay? Um, that's it for today. We'll see you next time.